In 1990, modern looks reigned supreme as fashion went fast forward. And in the headlines, designers looked to the future for the shortest looks ever. See why Jeffrey Bean was fashion's modern master in 1990. And meet British supermodel Naomi Campbell in one of her earliest interviews. Come inside fashion to the sensual world of Robert Lee Morris jewelry and find out how Notori lingerie came out of the closet. See if you remember the must-buy from the fall of 1990 and fast forward to the fashion classics of the time. Images of future style have occupied our minds for as long as man has tried to imagine it. But at the start of the new decade in 1990, the future seemed to be approaching faster than ever before. As the new millennium loomed, designers around the world created looks based on their vision of futuristic style. Fashion got sleeker, cleaner, more streamlined and more body conscious. Whether it's a throwback to 1960s fashion or a high-tech look forward, it was 20th century style speeding towards the 21st century, shifting into fast forward for the most modern looks in the galaxy. It was the fall fashion season 1990. There was a certain excitement in the fashion houses and workrooms and backstage at the fashion shows. The first collections of the new decade were about to be unveiled. The universal fashion message that year was modern fast forward style, as designers agreed that sleek 21st century looks are more body conscious than ever. I think the body is still very, very important. It's about everything working together. It's about how you, as a woman, would style yourself. So they, they like to, 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 to wear a very, very short dress. It's like uh, a freedom. I don't know. <laughs> Fall 1990 began with micro short dressing as the hottest look of the season. New York's Isaac Mizrahi showed it short and sweet in vivid pink. Milan's Jenny luxuriously layered a fur trim jacket over a leggy coat dress. And Charlotte Neuville cropped her jackets and skirts short in 1990. In Paris, Valentino impeccably tailored his suits, proving that short can still be elegant. Angelo Tarlazzi cut his freshest skirts thigh high. And Johnny Versace took micro lengths to new heights. But there was another way to cut it short in the fall of 1990. The only way to get really short <laughs> is to offer a short short. I mean, if you have a nice, nice body or something nice to show, it's nice to, to, to play with. Short shorts were the newest way to show off your legs with style in 1990. In Paris, at the start of the decade, Lambin shorts were its bright suit. And Jennifer George's short suit had checks that balance. Carmelo Pomodoro's stretch velvet hot pants were the sultriest in town. And Catherine Hamnett quilted it for hot cold weather dressing. Shorts even went into the evening that fall. Adrian Vitadini sprinkled hers with beaded snowflakes. There was one more look that put fashion in fast forward in 1990. Do you remember what it was? You've got the, um, the all-in-one base. One of the most exciting things about it to me is that it makes a woman just come alive the moment she has it on. The unitard was the sleekest, most modern way to dress in the fall of 1990. Norma Kamali showed her unitard in skin-tight crushed velvet. And London's Betty Jackson swings with earth tones.
In 1990, Donna Karen's unitard had a modern, glamorous attitude. And Christian Lacroix vividly colored his unitards in Harlequin prints. Lanvin took unitards into the night with sizzling metallics. And Bruce Oldfield interpreted modern with saucy elegance. Fashion classics from the fall of 1990. Designer Jeffrey Bean is recognized around the world as a pioneer and a leader in forward-thinking style. For years, his innovative designs have combined the qualities of ease and comfort with a luxurious feminine appeal, all with a distinctive look that quietly shouts modern elegance. Here's his take on fashion for fall 1990. So modern, it's one movement and that's it. And I'm toward the simplification and the modernization of clothing. And I don't mean minimalism, I mean uh, clothes that perform. Every season, Bean's designs do perform. In the fall of 1990, his creations were inventive both in fabric mixes and silhouette. There are many silhouettes on the collection. They're beautiful clothes that I think are modern. But while Bean was recognized as a master of modern simplicity, simple is often the most difficult look to execute. The road to simplicity is very complex. Uh, this collection is, is not about simplicity per se. It's complex simplicity of moving one step further in other directions, which is control for me. With silhouettes that are often very minimal, Bean is known for using the most luxurious fabrics, and 1990 was no exception. We can start draping this hood. Fabrics are glorious. Every designer is, that's the dictate to the collection. Whatever the fabrics say, one is obliged to do, and that's the way it should be. Once it is not done, it's sort of disastrous. So indeed, the fabrics are inspirational. It's not about color. The collection is about black and how inescapable it is and how it frames color, whether they be pastels or vibrant. It, it is wonderful. I think American women are just beginning to understand black. Color they know, or color with black, is, is very chic, very sophisticated, and very flattering. Bodies, um, Sexy, sensual clothes for evening. Um, belted suit showing the waistline again, which automatically rounds the hip. Very soft, sheer fabrics, flowing femininity. It's, it's a collection that's always dedicated to women and inspired by women. The modern elegance of Jeffrey Bean from the Fashion Vault, Fall 1990. Sexy Modern, the trademark of the late Johnny Versace, who died tragically in 1997. But in 1990, he was at his prime. The feeling is uh, an approach to modern women, uh, women who live uh, in harmony with this time, women who work, who go around. It's an international flair. Due to popular demand, 1990 saw the debut of Versace's new, less expensive line called Versus. Geared toward the younger customer, it was bold, colorful, and full of Versace's trademark sex appeal. Johnny Versace always had a bit, big request uh, from the young people to have his clothes, you know, to design clothes especially for them, to have uh, uh, the same concept that is giving into the Johnny Versace first line and to transfer that into this, uh, this new collection. Trans transfer the colors, the shapes, um, the idea of, of the Johnny Versace uh, fashion concept. Um, 
basically this is this is why he started this new project. Basically, it's a uh, shape body concept, and the colors are very bright, and uh, and at the same time, all these all the pieces are very comfortable. All the line is very comfortable to wear. I mean, you can always pick up only one piece and and be a versus a uh, young customer. The communication from Versace uh, to the press and to the world was, this is gonna be a young line, um, very reasonable prices, uh, so everybody, everybody basically can buy it. I mean, it's gonna be a tough work because uh, Johnny Versace always wants to have the best fabrics. Uh, he wants to always, always have the best fabrication and put all these things together. So final uh, uh, concept, pricing, quality, and look uh, has to satisfy uh, the final customer and, uh, and uh, the market. At the start of the decade, British model Naomi Campbell was moving fast forward into the superstar fame she achieved in the 90s. Here's how she got her start at the ripe old age of 16. An agent came up to me and gave me a card and, you know, said, you know, if you want to be a model, you can come to my agency. And I was like, sure, you know, you hear these stories. So I, you know, I thought about it, took the card to my mother and um, she was like, no. But Naomi's beautiful face could soon be seen on hundreds of magazine covers around the world. The kind of work I was doing was very young, like I was doing lots and lots and lots of editorial, and I still am, and, but it was more with a younger spirit. Now it's, um, it's a bit more sophisticated. They kind of really noticed me and that I'm growing up and you know, making me more womanly, which I like. <laughs> and I don't think I'm sexy, but it's a term that they use, and they're like trying to make me whatever, sexy mode, whatever you call it, but um, a bit more glamorous. Want to know Naomi's beauty secrets? I shouldn't even say this to you, but I eat McDonald's. <laughs> I eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. I eat pizza. But I, don't, I can't say that I eat every day because it's sometimes I just can't. There's no time. And, you know, it's not, it's not great eating just before you go to bed, so you just say forget it, I'd rather sleep than eat. That's my motto, so. But beauty tips, um, I like to have facials and manicures. I try to have them as often as I can. How did it feel to be one of the world's favorite models? It makes you feel good, it, it, well, it encourages you. I mean, someday, you know, it's not every day you're in a great mood or you might be having a bad day, it might be a downer for you, and it's like, for them to come up to you and say, oh, you know, you're doing really well, keep up the good work, that encourages me, and it's like, well, someone's out there, you know, and it's nice, I think, it's nice. It happens to me more in the US. It happens to me in London, but you know, the, the British are very reserved, you know, we're supposed to be very reserved, so, you know, they just look at you, but in the US, they come up to you, and they, you know, they write you letters, and it's really nice. Naomi would grow up and go on to become involved with celebrities like Robert De Niro and Sylvester Stallone. In 1990, she was exposed to the world's most exciting people and places. But she had her eyes fixed firmly on the future, and Naomi did succeed. It's tough being a model, but the reward is that you make your money, you save, you invest it well. Now, basically, when you're doing well, it's always good to think of the next step, move on to new things. Come inside fashion to the bold modern world of Robert Lee Morris. His distinctive line of jewelry is known for its liquid sensuality as well as its sculptured look. He gained recognition from the designs he created for Donna Karen, but his own signature line earned him international acclaim. When I began to do jewelry, it was body conscious. And I wanted to stress the point that this was meant to be worn and it was not meant to be idolized as an object, which was very different from the European concept of jewelry, that it was a, a sensual experience.
Well, I'm primarily a sculptor who's working to make things fit and move around the body. You know, I'm very interested in being a jewelry designer, though I'm not interested in the jewelry, the traditional jewel aspect of it. My concern is not for intrinsic value, diamonds, gold, platinum. I'm much more interested in showing how metal can be manipulated to become soft, caressable, liquid, languid. That to me is much more inventive and is, is what the jewelry world needs. Jewelry as an art form. This philosophy brought Morris to New York's Soho, where he opened Artware, a gallery-like environment which sold other artists' jewelry as well as his own. Artware was born by necessity. In 1977, I was literally forced to, into opening my own shop because I had no place else in New York City to represent me. And I pulled together about seven of um, the leading uh, jewelry designers that I respected the most and began the um, artware on just, you know, a couple thousand dollars budget. And I saw myself primarily as a fine artist dabbling in jewelry. And I've never seen myself really as a jeweler. So I wanted to make sure that when I built my own environment, my own retail environment, that I carried across the concept of art, gallery, museum, quality, educational, intellectual, as a, as a primary concept. Jewelry being something to be seen in a new light. Artware closed in 1995, but Robert Lee Morris still reigns as jeweler extraordinaire. For years, Nettori has been known for its luxurious lingerie. In the fall of 1990, Josie Nettori made news with a new line of lingerie that was designed to entertain outside the boudoir. It's really exciting for me, you know, Lynn had a vision that today there are really no boundaries in dressing and, you know, what we've been doing all along, you know, get, gets out of the bedroom and I think you have a lot of lingerie influence today in fashion and you're going to see a lot of them. but. Certainly, it goes from the boudoir to going out of the town. I've always felt what I've done, that lingerie is not just for the bedroom. And so I've always treated it as fashion. And, and it was just really, I wanted to make a statement that Notori is, you know, it, 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 it's a fashion of today. The 90s blurred the distinction between underwear and outerwear. And Notori's 1990 fall collection combines luxe fabrics with feminine designs for the modern woman. In our collection for fall, we're going to have a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of shirts with leggings, a lot of smoking jackets that to go out, a lot of, um, you know, white pajama-inspired things. Too luxurious to keep behind closed doors, Notori's wearable fashion goes beyond quiet nights for two. People that begin to understand that lingerie has really come out of the bedroom. Um, that it is more than what they thought it is. It is part of a woman's wardrobe. And it is really, as I said, uh, what Nator is about. It's a state of mind. It goes, it's beyond a lingerie. It's, it's, it's a concept of feeling good about yourself and surrounding yourself with it. Women today work very hard and they deserve to give themselves pleasures and that's what we attempt to do. All eyes were on the leg in the fall of 1990 as hemlines continued to rise. And as leggy looks became more popular, hosiery was the season's most important accessory. Designers agreed that the plush fabrics and vibrant colors of Hue legwear were a sure bet to get your legs a second glance. All their tights were great, really great. We used a lot of the Hue leg because it had a wonderful palette. It also had the opaque look that I was going for. Cotton tights had the sporty edge that I wanted. I didn't want a nylon sheen in this case, and they make a wonderful semi-opaque uh, semi kind of hose that had a cottony look to it in great colors. Kathy Moskai and Sandy Chilowich designed innovative hosiery for over a decade. But in 1990, the rise of the mini put Hue legwear in the fashion spotlight. I think what's happened with legwear, it's become a true accessory now. 
Uh, everybody needs legwear, it's true. Uh, but women now are wearing legwear for color. They're using it to personalize the look, uh, to uh, enhance the proportions of an outfit. Uh, and I think they're just using it in a true accessory form now. When you think about it, legs are a great, uh, a very large proportion of our bodies. And as hemlines are getting shorter, uh, the leg and accentuating the leg becomes, you know, an important factor in a wardrobe. For fall 1990, the thigh was the limit with Hugh Legwear. And working with top designers gave the design team a peek at the hottest trends to come. We're really trying to come up with accessories that, that work with what, what's out there, but also uh, that we really want the customer to see our product as something that she can use in a spontaneous way uh, to make her look enjoyable to her. Uh, we definitely want to give the customer pleasure. Designers are trying to look ahead, to move fashion toward the millennium. But it's interesting to note that as they move ahead, they're dragging the past with them in a kind of glitch, an instant replay, so that much of what we see looking modern actually looks like it came from the 60s or the 70s. There's a good reason for that. Designers were creating very modern looks back in the 60s and 70s, and so today designers are simply re-echoing that urge for simple modern shapes. And simplicity is where we're going to end up when we get to the millennium. Were you a slave to the fashion trends in the fall of 1990? If so, you probably bought the must-have item of the season, the tunic. It was the single most versatile piece that went over skirts, pants, or even solo. Here's a look back in the fashion vault to see how we wore the tunic from the time. In the fall of 1990, fashion shifted into fast forward for the new decade with fashion classics.